when you use these truth skills that are in, you know, described in the books, um, you get very good at just saying, here's what's going on for me, what's going on for you? Oh, and now that you've said that, here's how I'm reacting to that. That's what I mean by truth. It's, it's very simple and here now, but it's not what most people are used to. This is episode number 570 with Susan Campbell, using relationships for personal and spiritual growth. Very excited to have Susan back on the podcast. She was one of my very first guests 10 years ago. And unfortunately, she was one of the episodes that got lost. And uh, she was one of 150 episodes that got lost. So if you're wondering why I have 570 episodes, but you can only find like 400 of them, that is the reason why. So we were so excited to be able to get Susan back. And she's going to come on in just a minute. But I wanted to welcome you back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date and to support you in finding last love. I've written two books. The first is called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And this book is filled with all kinds of tips and exercises to help you grow your core confidence and learn to show up, speak up and stand up in life and in love. And my second book is called Choice Points in Dating. This was just published this year. And it's all about the choices we make, whether it's how to think about dating, who to choose, how to choose, how to know when to stay, when to go, how to navigate online dating. It's filled again with exercises because I believe that it's not enough just to tell people about things. It's important to show them how to do them for themselves. And you can find both books on Amazon for Kindle and paperback. Every week I bring you a tip on how to become a woman of value. And this is step nine, which is love is your birthright. It took me a long time to believe that everybody deserves love. We are all born with love in love, be love. We are born lovable. And I think that we often believe later in life that we're not lovable and that love only comes to the lucky ones or the thin ones or the pretty ones or the young ones or whatever it is that you tell yourself. So I just want you to know that you are worthy of love. And so if you are believing that love is not for you, just know, first of all, that you probably already have love in your life, even if it doesn't look like partnership, and that love is your birthright. Before I bring Susan on, I just want to invite you to join Your Last First Date. It's my fabulous Facebook group. It's for women over 40 who are really looking for a place that's supportive, kind, forward moving, not a place to come and just complain because that's what most of the groups out there do. And we have seven amazing monitors who help me keep this group safe and sane. So join us at your last first date. And now for my amazing guest, Dr. Susan Campbell. She's a relationship coach, and she's been doing this for over 50 years. She's been helping singles, couples, and professional teams communicate respectfully and responsibly. She's the author of many books, including Getting Real, Saying What's Real, Five-Minute Relationship Repair, and The Couple's Journey. And she's been featured on CNN's News Nightly, Good Morning America, The Dean Adele Show, Self Magazine, New Woman, Cosmo. She also trains coaches and therapists throughout the United States and Europe. Welcome back to the podcast, Susan. Thank you, Sandy. So we're going to talk about your book, Truth in Dating. And um, I remember you, you really have an incredible, beautiful focus on sharing honestly from the beginning. Many people don't do this. So tell us a little bit about what that looks like and what you mean by that. Truth in Dating is an approach to dating and new relationships where first it's in your own mind that you have the intent to use whatever relationships show up in your life to learn more about yourself and to help the other person heal and grow. So you have that mindset. And then you bring that up when you're first talking to somebody, uh, you know, checking them out online or meeting them at a party. Um, Well, after, you know, after you get to know that you're going to do a little dating, you let them know that you really are committed to telling the truth. And you know that a lot of people in the dating world are um, 
a little afraid of that and and that we all have been conditioned to kind of sugarcoat and play nice. But you want to have more intimacy in your life. And you thought, well, um, let's use the dating. That's a big part of my life right now is I'm, I'm meeting new people. Let's use that for learning to take risks, tell the truth, recover when things don't go so well, uh, deliver bad news, hear bad news, all in a compassionate way, not not brutal honesty, that not that sort of thing, but taking more risks to try out new aspects of yourself that you wouldn't maybe think to be as fluent with in the early stages of a relationship. But it's more fun. It's more alive when you're telling the truth. People are so afraid to speak the truth. They're afraid of turning the other person off. Uh, but then we have people who share too much. So yeah. if you can sort of give us some clarity around yeah. the difference between telling the truth and oversharing about your entire life story. <laughs> so my, my my definition of truth, I, I in the book Getting Real, I talk about, well, actually in Truth and Dating also, I talk about 10 truth skills. And these have more to do so in my world, telling the truth has more to do with being present to yourself and being present to the other. And that means feeling your body, feeling what you want, getting to know the other person. So you might you might be unsure about how much information they want. So they ask you a question, you know, tell me about yourself. If you're really present, you go, okay, like in my own case, uh, okay, maybe I have the tendency to just now they pushed a button and I'm going to record my whole life story for them here. Uh, well, what do you want? The short version or the long version? <laughs> you know, like stay present with what's coming up for you or say, you know, when you, you know, when you say that I'm getting excited, I, you know, I want to tell you about my childhood. Are you up for that? Uh, so like, just if you, if you are more present to, okay, there's another person there. And if I start to lose my audience, I notice it. I go, oh, I see you looking away. Was that, a, was that enough information? That, and mainly the issue in the beginning isn't whether it's too much information or not. It's, it's, it's usually how many of my uh, vulnerabilities do I share? And what's usually vulnerable is my fears and my wants. So how much of that to share? And I I want to say, um, if you want to really get to know somebody, be fluent with your in the moment. You know, truth is about your in the moment feelings and wants. So it's about here and now, you and me. And there can't really be too much information because you're not given a long story and a long explanation. You just say, well, when I saw you look away, I wondered this. So you get very good in when you use these truth skills that are in, you know, described in the books. Um, you get very good at just saying, here's what's going on for me. What's going on for you? Oh, and now that you've said that, here's how I'm reacting to that. That's what I mean by truth. It's, it's very simple and here now, but it's not what most people are used to. What I'm hearing is a lot of observations of mm -hmm. how's the other person responding to me. I ask questions. I check in before I download my entire life. I, <laughs> I, I was on a hike yesterday with a whole new group and we were on a three hour hike and this woman and I were walking together for most of the time. And oh my God, she started talking about her childhood. And <laughs> it was like, okay, the beginning, it was like, okay, yeah, I've had some mm -hmm. dysfunction like your dysfunction. Okay, great. We're bonding. And then it was just like, oh, and then my aunt did this and my sister did that. And my, oh, and this person. And I was just yeah. like, I just met you. I don't want to hear yeah. all of that. And so I found myself kind of withdrawing and looking for other people to talk to. So what would you have recommended I do differently. I probably but, should have said something, but I just, yeah. I was so kind of flooded. It was yeah. hard for me to say anything in the moment. Well, I've, I've been in that situation on like first dates. Uh, so I remember one time I, I said, could we push pause for a minute? Cause he was talking and talking and I couldn't 
find a way to enter the conversation. And I'm I'm pretty extroverted, but I was having trouble. <laughs> so I said, you know, uh, this was me. Now, not everybody can can do it as easily as I do it, but I say, can we push pause now? What I'm experiencing is you're telling me a whole bunch of stuff about yourself that I probably would want to know, but being just so passive and not having a chance to get into the conversation, I'm just having a, I'm having a little trouble here. Could we kind of slow it down? Cause I'd like to get into the conversation too. You know? mm. And then, and then that worked for a while. Sandy, and then he started his monologue again, and, and I said, "Wait, I, you know, I, I didn't even say it in a too gentle way." I said, "Wait, um, are you anxious? You know, I really like you." You know, I said that to him I, because that was true. I really, I, I liked the guy, even though th that was going on. And then we really got to a more relaxed place and he admitted he was anxious. He was performing for me, and that was on a first date. Now. That might sound a, a, a little bit um, too risky for a lot of our listeners, but you can do this. You can say, could we push pause and just sort of check in about how this conversation's going? And that's a technique that uh, I, I do offer in my books. And and then, so what were you feeling when you were telling me about your aunt and, and your aunt's siblings and you know, I mean, what was what was that about you know and for me I I was I was really with you until you started talking about people that I don't even know you know mm -hmm. and sometimes you just have to be able to deliver bad news with love in your heart that's the big thing is is through the truth and dating approach which is telling the truth as an agreed upon practice between two people. Like, we know we're not good at this, but we're gonna practice it and we're gonna learn together. That's, you know, that's the idea. Um, you do, so you sort of do it by permission. As you do that more and more with dates or people who are just people you meet on a hike, you get more fluent with this kind of thing, more confident. And you really, you really can bring more love and humor into awkward moments because they're going to happen. And you need to learn to deal with unpleasant you know, moments, awkward moments, uh, to live in the world in a graceful way. It's beautiful the way that you describe this. I think what, the, the whole scenario of somebody talking too much and not, not stopping and not including you in the conversation, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear about all the time. It's like, People will then label those people as narcissistic yeah. or self-centered or whatever it is. And a lot of times they're nervous. A lot of times they just, like you said, are you anxious? I've told my clients to, to interrupt them, <laughs> you know, so you're doing it kindly with push pause. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more like put, put your hand on their, on their arm and That's say, may I interrupt you? You've been talking a long time and I'm finding like, you know, is there anything you want to know about me? You know, and I think just knowing that, but, but also just describing like, here's what's happening. I'm, I'm having a hard time following. I'm mm -hmm. losing, you know, focus. My son will tell me this all the time. Mom, I have no idea what you're talking about anymore. <laughs> like, what are you, what are you trying to say? Cause I'm losing, I'm losing the thought. And there are people who jump around with conversation and, it's hard to follow and just to let them know I'm, I'm really want to hear you, but I'm having trouble following. Yeah, that's that's really something that we can do, Sandy. You're making it sound easy also. I mean, it it's uh, it's <laughs> easier than you think once you take a few risks and you survive. Yes. And instead of living in your head and making up a story, which is also, you know, what about the practice of saying the story I'm making up? Yeah, it'd be good to always um, use I statements like, um, let me tell you what's going on for me. You know, I've been wanting to comment on the things that you were saying. And I just seemed, seemed like I couldn't find a, a way in because, mm. the, you know, you were talking one subject after another. Could you do me a favor and take a few breaths between topics? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, make requests too. Yes. 
people yeah. are often, especially in the early stages of a relationship, um, inhibited about making requests. And some people have that belief, well, if I have to ask for it, then um, they're not they're not good. They're not a good person at reading my needs. Well, be careful with that one, because that may be just an avoidance that you have about not wanting to take the risk to ask for what you want. And we all have to learn to do that at some time. Yeah. So there's all these fears that come up when uh, somebody takes that risk and speaks mm -hmm. up, asks for what they want. So let's talk first about why people are afraid. Childhood neglect and like many traumas where you asked for what you wanted. Maybe it was even in the crib, you know, you cried and nobody came to pick you up or you would be sort of overlooked at a, at a family dinner table scene. There's so many stories that I hear as a, a, a psychotherapist of what I call learning the wrong thing as a child. It feels traumatic to you, but your parents didn't do anything horrible. I mean, there were parents who were truly neglectful and you know just left their kids alone all the time and ignored their kids when they tried to get attention. But even short of that, almost all of us had painful experiences with wanting something and not getting it. And the unfortunate learning that can come out of that for some of us is my needs don't matter. What good does it do to ask for what I want? I won't get it. Uh, I'll be seen as uh, too needy. Like I'm, I'm one of those children who were told, um, you know, grow up, you're too sensitive. So we learn um, that we learn that to associate pain with asking for what we want, the pain of rejection or being criticized. So we, as an adult, then we get to unlearn that, and that has to be a kind of conscious goal. And sometimes in relationships, you can help each other unlearn faulty childhood patterns like fear of rejection. But you have to kind of start by admitting it. So you ask, why are people afraid to tell the truth? And one of the main truths is asking for what you want. Um, it's childhood trauma, childhood learning the wrong thing, so that we didn't have the confidence that um, when something upsetting did happen, though this is another thing, is kids don't get enough co-regulation. So attachment theory now in psychology is... Um, bringing this term co-regulation out into the public discussion. Co-regulation means when you're upset, you can go to somebody else and get comforting and nurturance. And children need that. Children need to be able to have somebody to go to when they're hurt or upset that soothes them and shows them that you can be upset and then your nervous system can become calm. And so when you get co-regulation as a child, you learn how to self-regulate as an adult, and you're not as afraid of upsetting interactions because you know that your nervous system can be, ah, and then you can go, oh, let me breathe, let me hug myself and calm myself. So if we didn't get that kind of parenting, it's something we're going to need to learn as adults, and, uh, and that's called self-soothing or self-compassion. And I have a couple other books uh, my recent one from triggered to tranquil that talks about how to go from eh, to calm and available for the next moment in a relationship, how to deal with trigger reactions. All this stuff is just so essential for being yeah. a healthy human and having healthy relationships. And as you were talking about all the ways as children, we don't get our needs met. It's incredible as adults, first of all, not asking for what we want, but also not knowing how to ask. And I think so many of us, um, we don't make direct requests. We kind of hint around what we want. We hope that somebody reads our mind, like you said before, and that doesn't work because nobody can tell what's going on for you. Even we don't usually know what's going on for us. And so learning how to identify what is going on for me. Like a lot of what you're sharing today is, is about 
observing, seeing mm-hmm. what's going on for me, what's going on, how do I feel in this moment? Yeah. If you're not used to doing that, how do you begin that process? Think about a situation, just any situation. This would be like homework for our listeners who don't know what they feel. And, um, and then begin to ask yourself, like, what did I feel in that situation? What do I even imagine, you know, play, play around with it. What do I even imagine the other person was feeling? Begin to bring the question of feelings into your world, first of all. And there are many lists of feelings that you can get online. You know, I, I have one in my book, Saying What's Real. The nonviolent communication community has this huge list of different kinds of feelings. And just go online, look for a list of feelings and go, oh, that's a feeling. Oh, do I ever feel that? Do I have resistance to feeling that? Like the, like anger, for example, or even sadness. And just begin to be develop your vocabulary first for the language of feelings, but also know that in any given moment, maybe you're not very present in the moment, but like, let's say you uh, take a bathroom break during a, a first meeting with somebody, take a bathroom break, you can check in. What am I feeling? Oh my God, my heart's beating so fast. Well, that's a body sensation that's very important. So feelings and body sensations are both the kinds of things that help you tune into okay, what is my present experience? Do I need something? If I'm anxious, I must need something. I need to feel safer. And and you discover this by just paying attention after a while. These words are not going to come to you immediately. But um, when you begin to explore around in just the whole idea that feelings and body sensations can be known, Oh, that's the beginning. I didn't know how to do any of this. Like 20 years ago, when I was getting divorced, we were going through the process of divorce. And my husband finally realized he needed to get some help after me talking to him about this for 20 years. And he learned nonviolent communication. And Mm -hmm. so he was finally able to process what he was feeling and what he was needing. He even created a labyrinth that people could walk. Mm -hmm. He started teaching empathy and having an empathy Mm -hmm. labyrinth. If you go online, you can find empathy labyrinth under the nonviolent communication. And it was fascinating because we were able to end our marriage with really compassionate conversations. My kids were very confused, like, why are you divorcing? You're talking to each other. But it it was a beautiful way to end um, a very difficult time in our lives. And, you know, with him, it was very kind of formulaic. Mm -hmm. I've, what is your need? What need isn't being met? And it just felt like annoying to my children when he would say things like this. Mm -hmm. So you have to adapt all of this to yourself and start to really understand that we have more than three emotions (laughs) that mad, glad, sad, Mm -hmm. and, um, and to start having that vocabulary and realizing that a need and a feeling are linked and I think we we don't realize, like when people say, what do you want? What do you need? You don't, you have no clue unless you do this work because we've been talked out of our feelings and our needs. That comment you made about being too sensitive, mm-hmm. you're overly sensitive. Nobody's overly anything. Like you are you have a right to be sensitive. It's, it's a superpower to have sensitivity. That's right. That's why you became a therapist probably, <laughs> but it's, you also have to learn the skills to not absorb everything everybody says all the time. That's, that's the challenge of a, of a, a very sensitive person, but it is, it's a, a wonderful thing to have sensitivity. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. 
One tip I'm just thinking of, too, about knowing what you feel. I think we can all imagine ourselves or remember situations. So you're in the situation. And do I feel like relaxed and what we normally call positive? Or do I feel fearful and contracted and kind of resistant? So it's basically, am I a yes or a no to this situation? Most people can kind of calibrate that. And that's a good start. And I find that one of the um, most kind of amusing ways that I can deliver bad news to my partner is things like, um, as you say that, I feel some resistance coming up in me. <laughs> I love that phrase because <laughs> it's just, it, it's just, it's here and now. It's not negative toward him, but he's kind of realizing that I'm owning it. But I'm I'm able to differentiate myself in a slightly humorous way. You know, the way I say it, I feel some resistance coming up. So if any of our listeners like that, or I, I feel that, no, I, I, no, you either feel sort of magnetized and drawn to something or you feel like, Ugh, uh, and those are two things that you can easily uh, check in with yourself about. And if you feel, uh, uh, then you, you probably have a need to, I'm going to say most cases feel safer. And what what helps you feel safe? Oh, um, knowing that the other person accepts me the way I am would be a, a common answer. And um, then what do you feel as you notice that? So I'm I'm all about paying attention to the thoughts that come up and then witnessing, like being able to be a little bit more of a witness and observer of the feelings that makes it a little safer to feel the feelings without getting swallowed up and overwhelmed. I like that. I think, again, body sensations, most people are completely disconnected from what's my body feeling? I don't know. And so, you know, beginning to be aware of my body's feeling contracted, my body is feeling open. If it's contracted, I'm not feeling safe. What do I need to feel safe? I had a situation with somebody that I had met who I was coming to, I was actually traveling to where he was. And it was a, it was an airplane. It was a flight that I was taking and I was, it was like a big risk, an emotional risk for me to travel to him. And he was telling me that the apartment that I was going to be staying at with him was, it sounded horrible. It sounded like there were like lizards on the walls. It, it was just, it was just like mosquitoes. And he's telling me he had slept there the night before. And he's like, I don't know, you know, just there'll be a net over the bed. You'll be fine with the mosquitoes. I have bug spray and everything's fine. I'm like, I don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I said that to him. I said, I, you know, I'm looking at hotels because the way you're describing it, I don't feel safe staying in this apartment. And he said, look, I understand. Why don't you take a look at it before you make your final decision and whatever you decide will be fine. And so I came to the apartment. I didn't see a single mosquito. There were no lizards. I, he had taken care of everything, but it scared the hell out of me. Yeah. And, but it took a lot for me to say, I don't feel safe. That is a beautiful example of risk taking. And it turned out well. <laughs> it did. <laughs> it doesn't always turn, turn out badly. Like most of the time, even if it doesn't be it doesn't turn out perfect, you feel stronger and you got more aliveness because you're not like holding back and should I or shouldn't I say this? So I love that example, Sandy. Mm, well, thank you. It's I could not have done that years ago. And I think even if you what 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 is considered turns out badly for a lot of people, like if I say something and the answer isn't yes, then then that's a bad outcome. But the actual truth is that it's a good outcome because you know sooner rather than later that this person is not going to be the right person for you. So yeah, if you can right. talk a little more about that, because I think a lot of people are afraid to bring up things early mm -hmm. on because they're afraid of the answers. Yeah. Well, I want to sell the idea that upsets and emotional discomfort are a normal part of adult relationships. And yet, yes, we do tend to, most of us want to avoid or minimize those. So, so that's, that's okay. We want to minimize them. 
But um, if you're going, if you're dating with the idea of a long-term relationship, like marriage type relationship as your goal, you're going to need to deal with differences and upsets and conflicts. So let's conduct dating with that in mind that, uh, you know, it's scary. You might have to say it's scary for me to bring this up, but, um, you know, you've actually not ever been on time for a meeting. And I don't know if I want to ask what's that about or if I want to tell you what my mind jumps to. Well, I'll just tell you what my mind jumps to. It's like maybe I'm not that important in your life and you're just squeezing me in. That's where my mind goes. So help help me out here. And that's just another example of bringing up something that's uncomfortable that might have the other person feel defensive. And if they do, like you suggested a minute ago, if they do get defensive, I don't think you should write them off the first time because people <laughs> need second chances. But you should bring it up. If they get defensive and can't seem to handle sincere feedback, that's a data point that you, you want to keep in mind as you're going through your mate selection. Too many of us are focused on, do they like me instead of how do I feel toward that person? So don't give away your eyes when you're dating. And also uh, when you do bring up an upsetting thing, the important thing is how do we communicate about it? It's not to avoid upsets, but it's to skillfully get through to a feeling of, oh, that's what was going on in you. I misinterpreted that. Phew, thank goodness. Or, gee, I don't especially like what's going on in you, but I can handle that. Let me, uh, let me soothe myself a little bit, take a couple of breaths and get grounded within myself so I can handle bad news better. So all, all of these little conversational bumps in a dating relationship are going to prepare you to have a, a better life with or without a partner. It's so true. And these are great sentence stems to get people started. I think what, what I also want to highlight is something you just brought up about how do we feel in their presence? Mm -hmm. I think that the focus is on so many things that don't matter. You know, it's just how many degrees do they have and what is their job? And, you know, like, I don't care what somebody does for a living. I honestly don't. I care what it means to them. I mm. care what difference they want to make in the world. I care what their passions are. I care who they are, who they've become, what they've done to become that person. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, like one person yesterday on the hike was saying that she dated somebody who said he was a hiker. And she goes, oh, when did you hike? And he said, in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> So it was quite a long time ago. Um, I dated somebody like that. He was like, yeah, I was really active, you know, when I was 25. And I'm like, but you're not active anymore. <laughs> like, I want to know what you're doing today. So the other part is that, you know, when, when people do get together with friends who meet your partner for the first time, wow. you often, people will often say, what did you think of him? Or what did you think of her? And the better thing to ask, and I would love to hear your opinion on that is, what did you think of me in his presence? How did you think, what side of me did you think he brought out? What, you know, how did you observe us as a team, not just what was he like? I'm I like curious you broadening that question out a bit. I I, I especially like the, the part about our interaction. What did you notice about our interaction that I might not have been able to see? Because other people can um, observe things, but we don't, I, I was, I was going to say, we don't almost like dare to ask for that depth of feedback. And uh, I think it's really something you could ask your friends and they would love to uh, comment on. They, they'd probably feel valued. And if they feel, um, awkward and you see the nonverbals, you know, or, um, or uh, oh, he was nice, or, you know, they, they don't even answer the question you ask. They just say he was nice. You know, that wasn't your question. <laughs> um, let it go. You know, maybe 
for that moment. Later, you can do some more truth telling with that particular friend, like, like, uh, hey, it looked like maybe you were uncomfortable with that question. Were you? Mm-hmm. So one of the truth skills I teach is you make an observation about somebody um, and your mind makes up some kind of an assumption or a story about them. Check out your stories. People feel, don't mind having us tell us, tell them my assumptions. I tell you my assumption, but I don't get attached to that assumption. I'm just letting you know what came up for me, but I'm really interested in, is that true for you? And that's a very important, I call that one of those truth skills. Mm, very important. Yeah, that I have a child, one of my children doesn't like when I check in with her before I have a conversation. I'll say, are you open to talking now? She'll just like, just tell me. I don't like when you check in. So what do you do with somebody who's resistant to some of this language? Um, I would tr- try to respect it and um, adapt my style to that. However, if we are in a relationship, like let's say it's with, with, with your daughter and that me bringing up stuff with, without a preamble, without saying, is this a good time? Me bringing up stuff seems to cause problems. Then we would say, uh, then I'd have to invite her into a conversation. Uh, it seems to me when I don't let you know that I have something like serious on my mind and I just launch into it, that doesn't seem to work that well for me. You you uh, aren't able to get there with me. So I, I think we need that preamble. And that, so bring it back. If, if there's a real reason to have that preamble other than that you learned it in communication school, you know, <laughs> some of us, are, you know, we learned all these great techniques, but one size doesn't fit all. No. But if it's, but the biggest one for partnerships is sweeping conflict under the rug, things that really should be talked about. And that that heading, like it's not can we you know, can we talk exactly, but it's I have some feelings to clear about something that happened yesterday. Are you available? And people do need to be able to um, take the time to have that agree- agreement that they're going to do that at regular intervals. If they're if they're having conflicts and the conflicts are getting swept under the rug and the way you come about having that agreement is you say, you know, I keep hearing, you know, every month or so I hear a big dump about all the things I've done wrong in the past month, you know, and I'd rather they didn't build up that much. Could we have a ritual every week where we dump that stuff out you know, in a conscious <laughs> way? So if there's a reason to have these special communication tools, like, is this a good time to talk about something that's a little bit serious? That would that would be a communication tool because you're setting a context before launching in. And a lot of communication schools recommend that, but as we see, it doesn't always work for our uh, young children, or for our teenage kids or our young adult kids. Yeah. Yeah, no, those are good. Those are really good tips because I think we often, just like I was saying how my ex-husband uses language that my kids couldn't relate to. It's like, don't tell me what, you know, I have a need that's not being met. You know, may I make a request? It just sounds like not natural and we want to have natural conversations, but at the same time, a lot of these topics are not natural. They're, they're awkward. They're, they're not easy. And so learning the tools is important, but also learning who you're dealing with and what your partner, who, who your partner is, what kind of communicator they are, what kind of communicator you are and what their capacity is for hearing things. Like I know certain people in my life have a very short window for hearing Mm -hmm. things Um, I tried something the other day with another one of my daughters who I asked her a question. She immediately got shut down and she goes, Oh, I'm just, I'm tired. I I can't really go into this. And I said, you know, I'm only looking for one sentence. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I kind of simplified it for her. And she was like, Oh, Oh, well, here's, this is my thought. And it was just like, it opened the conversation back up. And so she's coming to live with me in a couple of weeks. So (laughs) 
for for a couple of weeks, not permanently, but um, I'm already preparing myself for her style of shutting down. The communication can become very hostile easily if I'm not careful. And so this this mm-hmm. kind of you know interaction we have with partners, with dates, with mm-hmm. anybody, it's just important to to check yourself and to also prepare for the conversations, to have them be as open and honest as possible so you don't sweep things under the rug. Well, there's something I love about what you did there with your daughter who was resistant. You didn't give up. In important relationships, sometimes the other person will say, oh, no, I don't I don't have the bandwidth for that. But if it's really important, <clears throat> You can negotiate a little bit. It's a risk because, you know, you're at the risk of, oh, you can't take no for an answer. I I want people to learn to take no for an answer and respect boundaries, but also not to give up too soon. And what I like about what you did was you did a little bit of negotiating. Let me say that another way and see if this works. Now, if that second try hadn't worked, I would say, let it go. Remember, you don't have to just give up right away when somebody shows resistance. I, I really mm. want to get that across. And you you gave us a perfect example of that. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, my son started doing something with her, which is starting with, I'm your friend. Wow. Because I think for a lot of people, they believe you're there to attack them. Mm-hmm. And that's something I learned in nonviolent communication also is to really start with the intention. My intention is to connect. My intention is to get closer. My intention is to repair. And I mean, repairing, we could have another five hour conversation on (laughs) conflict and repair, but it's, it's so important to not, to start the conversation where somebody's not on the defensive thinking you're out to attack me because they're bringing their old triggers and wounds to the table. Yeah. yeah you know, I wrote a book called five minute relationship repair and it has scripts <clears throat> to help scripts and like fill in the blank scripts to help people repair after a conflict so that they don't, you they don't do what people often do when they call it repair is, um, just go over the thing again, you know, trying to be heard again, but with like maybe more civilized voice tones or something, and they call that repair. So if you know how to repair and and say, well, this was what was going on in me when I said that rude thing, I was triggered and I imagined that uh, (laughs) my higher brain was offline. If I had it to do over, I would have said da-da-da. Just a, a, you know, short script. Um, if people know how to repair, then you're not so afraid of creating little upsets here and there, because you will. <laughs> and we need to know that they can be, messes can be cleaned up. Yes. And they have to be exposed. They can't yeah. be buried. As yeah, we said, exactly, the, uh, exactly. the rug gets very lumpy if you keep putting things under it <laughs> Yes, and you trip over it. Um, Susan, this conversation is just so wonderful. I think there's so many helpful tips. I love that you share exercises and fill in the blanks and scripts and your books are so valuable. I'm going to go order the, the five minute repair and just there's so much good here. Um, so if you can share with us your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date. Well, <clears throat> my answer is a little paradoxical. Don't worry about whether it's going to, you, there's going to be another date after this. Try to enjoy the experience of getting to know the person, revealing yourself, seeing how it feels to speak the truth. The process of just conversing with another human, if you could put more value on that instead of the outcome of, oh, I got to get the next date after this, that will have you be more relaxed and um, hopefully delightful because you're not worrying about the future. You're in the here and now. Yeah, so many people just, they're so future focused. Like I I used to be that way. If this isn't the last first date, Mm -hmm. then I, it's a failure. failure. You know, somebody fixes me up with somebody. This used to be in my twenties and it was not the right fit. I'd be like, Mm -hmm. what were they thinking? I just Mm -hmm. wasted an hour and a half. You know, that's That's not a waste. (laughs) I love, not a waste. waste. And, and 
every every date is an opportunity and like what you said is is beautiful that you can practice these skills practice speaking the truth practice being more in your body practice just getting to know another person and having them get to know you because that's so valuable i love it well susan i know you have a free gift for our audience can you tell us what that is it's an ebook that i wrote called getting real confidence and it basically helps people overcome their fear of emotional discomfort because i think that's the key to confidence is realizing that okay whatever happens i'll be okay and so it it helps you get to that mindset so that can be found at susancampbell.com forward slash home and all the other links to Facebook, Twitter, and um, everything else that where you can find Susan's books and all about her will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here again with me and sharing your incredible wisdom. You really are a gift. Thank you so much, Sandy. And thanks to our audience for listening. Thank you so much for being here, for listening to the show, for being a fan. If you love our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Follow us, share it with a friend. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application.